this lesson for the Quantity Project class, Why Religion Only Makes Sense If You Don't Think About It. Subcaption, you've been primed. That refers to information we were told, heard, or perhaps read somewhere that included formed categories, jargon, things that had no biblical meaning perhaps, and perhaps could have, but we did not know um, how to apply that meaning or found it in any particular context. So DAISY, this is the acronym for Arminianism, uh, Diminished Depravity, which we'll notice in a moment that's somewhat equivalent to what Calvinism teaches. Abrogated election, apparently God can reason you out, but I don't think they teach that. I think they teach election. Uh, well, I don't really know what they mean, uh, except that the purpose of God for being elected would be negated. We have a text, Luke chapter 7, where the Pharisees negated God's boule, determinate counsel, unto themselves. Now, not unto God. Impersonal atonement. Of course, it doesn't speak of the relation of atonement. That's for sins, and that's in relationship to the Father. Sedentary grace. Uh, that must be a pejorative phrase, diminishing the view of Arminianism, and then yieldable justification. I think that's a academic way of saying lose your salvation. So we'll look at some of this and move on. What is sedentary grace? No one knows. Here's grace, caris. There's a Strong's number, graciousness of manner or act, uh, the divine influence upon the heart. And that's true. It's not only unmerited favor, but divine influence and its reflection in the life, including gratitude. So you notice grace and attitude is gratitude. Here, let's see, tulip. We'll get to that. Back to grace in just a moment. And they teach total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. And again, this is these are formed categories. Uh, they're augmented, and we'll notice that this would be let's say, perceived as credible and with, I guess we'd say, high rationale or critical thinking until we think about it. Total depravity, this is the late R.C. Sproul. In the Reformed tradition, total depravity does not mean utter depravity. We often use the term total as a synonym for utter or for completely, so the notion of total depravity conjures up the idea that every human being is as bad as that person could possibly be. So that begs a question, and here's a good question. How does diminished depravity differ from but not utterly depraved or but not utter depravity? It doesn't. It's just they're saying the same thing, which results in the same thing. So in Daisy, diminished depravity, and then in Tulip, it's total but not utter. And this makes sense in religion, of course, in that um, group think if you will. So total depravity equals diminished depravity, and we've just gone in a circle. Uh, there's no lexical definition for depravity. How depraved is that? Now notice how we use the word depraved, the English word we don't find in the Bible. Uh, that is in the English Bible, King James, for example. But in Genesis 2, 9, the Septuagint, we noticed G4190, Poneru, the tree of the knowledge of good, the noble thing, good and evil. And we notice in Matthew 7, 11, that same word, he said, um, since therefore you yourselves, while being evil ones, there's that word, are noticing to be giving good gifts to your particular children. So this now, we can see the implication of knowing what the Bible actually says. We have no reason to banter between diminished depravity or total but not utter depravity. All of that's just unnecessary words. They're empty words, and we have a definition for it. Perseverance of the Saints, late R.C. Sproul again. I think this little catchphrase, Perseverance of the Saints, is dangerously misleading. <laughs> so he totally opposes the idea. He says it suggests that the perseverance is something we do. Uh, ironically, though, he goes down here and mentions those effectually called by God and have been reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit endure to the end. Uh, again, they teach unless you endure to the end, you won't be saved. 
And again, he even used David as a classic example, a model of a regenerate in the Old Testament who committed uh, heinous sins. I don't suppose anyone could surpass David in what he had done and how he abused his authority or misused it and how he conspired, stole another man's wife, eventually conspired, had that man murdered, executed. And apparently it was during wartime. So even as a, a leader entrusted the welfare of the people, his concern seemed to be self-serving. So again, um, R.C. Sproul uh, doesn't even support perseverance of the saints. So what does it mean to endure to the end? I don't know. David couldn't endure one night in a palace. David couldn't endure the hardships of war. David couldn't support the war effort. Uh, David did not uh, find, we did not find David praying on behalf of the nation, assuring the welfare of the nation. He was actually jeopardizing the national security of a soldier out in battle and engaged in his responsibilities of war. And the very person he was protecting or the family, his own life and his own home was destroyed by the very king who was responsible for the welfare of the people, including um, Uriah the Hittite. Election will define the term Luke 6, 13. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples and of them he chose, reasoned out. The word chose is reasoned out. Twelve whom he also named apostles. There's the word ek. Ek out from like an ex and exit sign. Lego the verb of logos reason reason out verb. Ek lego mime you notice here is middle voice from G fifteen thirteen fifteen thirty seven. It says to select make choice choose out chosen. That's the word in Luke six thirteen. So of all of his disciples, he reasoned out these for himself. Only those already in Christ are reasoned out for his purpose and service. Ephesians 1, 4, just as he reasoned us out for himself. Speaking of God, the father, you notice Jesus reasoned out for himself from his disciples. And now Paul speaking of God, the father reasoned us out for himself in him. And you recall Galatians 2, 16, we're persuaded by the gospel to believe into Christ Jesus. So we enter Christ Jesus by faith in time and space. And as a consequence of having been persuaded by the gospel, Paul said, as ones who have noticed and continue to notice, and here's the good news he noticed, that no kind of man is being justified out from any kind of works of any kind of law, except through Jesus Christ faithfulness. He says, ones who've noticed that, that good news, even we ourselves believed into Christ Jesus in order that we might be declared right out from Jesus Christ faithfulness. Atonement and redemption. Uh, this is, uh, let's just sort it out the way the Bible has it. Atonement's for sins, not ours only, but for the sins of the entire world. Redemption, redemption is for kins. Uh, just as we noticed in John three sixteen. 16, uh, God, the father that is loved in this manner in so much that he gave his only begotten son in order that the one who is believing into him, that is his son, Jesus, the one who was speaking and giving this account might not perish. And then we learned at the end of that gospel that the purpose of that provision of Christ for believers was so that others would believe that we might believe simple form of action that Jesus is the Christ and as ones who are believing might have life in his name. So religion says atonement, they divide it between limited, unlimited, redemption, between universal or particular. Now that helps catalyze the friction, keeps generating the conflicts, uh, which seems to be the only energy among dead constructs. Atonement is in relationship to the Father, whom Christ, his only begotten Son, conciliated, appeased, and propitiated by his death. It was all for all sins, for all men, for all time, in relationship to the Father. Redemption is in relationship to the ones persuaded by the gospel to believe Jesus Christ for everlasting life. The moment you believe, you become a child of God. In that moment, not ongoing action. In that moment, you believe, not ongoing action. But in that moment, you believe you become a child of God. You become known by God. You become quickened. And redemption's in Christ Jesus. So that's uh, that was self-evident. And then irresistible grace. Looks like grace is universal when we look at this. Uh, Stephen said they do always resist the Holy Spirit. He asked which 
of the prophets did you not persecute? And that is the ultimate expression of negating persuasion by Moses and the prophets, Luke 16, 31, John 3, 36, negating persuasion by the Son, 1 Peter 4, 17, negating persuasion by the gospel of the God, that's the Father of Jesus Christ. We've got lessons on all of that. And the gospel of God is concerning the grace of God. We have this word, akaristos, the negation. It's a negative particle in function it negates, in meaning it is void or without. And it means unthankful. It's an adjective. And then we have krestos, and it refers to being useful, gracious. And then notice this, Luke 6, 35, but love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind, gracious unto the unthankful. Notice that grace, negative ones, and to the evil ones. Notice kind also means useful, as the worker bee, for example, serves the interest of the hive until death and receives no reciprocity. The worker bee is called that simply because the worker bee does all the work. And Jesus, for example, is the one who worked the works of the one who sent him. He's the one that fulfilled the law, fulfilled all righteousness, remained obedient unto death, debased himself, became the form of a bond slave, was willing to be cursed and hanged on the tree as a curse in our place. He was willing to die for our sins, according to the scriptures, willing to be buried and then trust, believe his father to raise him from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures, and do all that for our justification. And again, this text is very much indicative of how uh, universal his grace is. He is uh, it's why we see a demonstration of rain on the just and the unjust. We see him being kind, grace, gracious to uh, us as well. If Even if we're a believer and been born again, there's times where we may not express gratitude. And yet he continues to be gracious to us, come alongside, comfort us with the scriptures, lead us, guide us, train us, educate us, disciple us directly, personally, and immediately. So this is just a brief introduction, but it's only when you think about these things in terms of what the Bible actually teaches, you center it back on Christ who pointed our attention, direct our attention to his Father who sent him, and the Holy Spirit who testifies of Jesus, glorifies Jesus, and gives us the a proper focus on all this. So you have a blessed day. Enjoy this brief introduction. But this is why religion only makes sense uh, unless you think about it. And when you think about it, uh, you can walk away from it so easily and then notice this gracious God who so loved us that he gave us his son who was so gracious to teach us to love others because he himself is kind and gracious unto all people, even those who negate his grace. So have a blessed day and enjoy this lesson.